Drugs that do a pretty good job of easing symptoms of depression and drugs that really help people struggling with obesity have a couple things in common. The first is that we have almost no idea how they work. And the second is that there's often shame around using them because so many people view issues of mental health and weight control as personal failings. In a recent article for the New York Times, I argue that we should shift focus from these two things and focus instead on significantly improving people's lives, which these drugs do. And that's the topic of this week's healthcare trio. We like to think we understand the drugs we take, especially after rigorous trials have proved their efficacy and safety. But sometimes we know only that medications work. We don't know why. Recently, I faced this conundrum regarding drugs for mental health conditions and obesity, two heavily stigmatized health issues with causes and treatments that science doesn't fully comprehend. Until a few years ago, I had controlled my depression and anxiety through decades of counseling. I was reluctant to try medications because the medical understanding of them seemed vague. For instance, we know that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, leave more serotonin floating around your neurons in your brain, but we don't fully understand how or why that makes a difference. We also can't explain why some people benefit from SSRIs and others do not. Because of this, many people still believe those who take them don't really need them. I also believe that if I was strong enough, I didn't need medication. But in 2021, when I was under a substantial amount of stress, I had a panic attack on vacation and fell partway down a mountain. I was airlifted to a hospital, alarming my wife and friends, and it was clear I wasn't okay. My physician recommends Sertraline, an older but widely used SSRI. And while I was skeptical that it would make a difference, I tried it. I was wrong to doubt. It's had a remarkable effect on my mood and almost everyone around me noticed the difference. I was more optimistic, friendlier, and more engaging. I was forced to reconsider why I had avoided taking the medication for so long. I think it's because, even though I realized this isn't true, taking it felt like an omission of failure. Because I didn't know the exact mechanism that caused my anxiety to be uncontrollable, and no one else did either, it seemed as if I must be cheating to use a drug that greatly helped my situation. It felt like a crutch or a shortcut, especially because even as a doctor, I can't explain why the medication works for me or for anyone else. I've recently faced a similar scenario with new obesity drugs. I've struggled with my weight for most of my life. I've always been overweight, and in the last few years I'd slipped into obesity, according to my body mass index. I exercise regularly, and I carry the weight pretty well, but it bothers me immensely. It especially troubles me because I have a fair amount of self-discipline and I eat quite healthfully. Though I've tried every diet, nothing's really helped. I lose up to 10 pounds and then plateau till the weight crept back up. Because I'm so careful about what I eat, my weight has not yet led to other health consequences. But I know what could happen if I stop being mindful. My father was morbidly obese. It led to lower quality of life and mental health issues and probably contributed to his death a few years ago. Despite all the advances in science, we don't know why some people, even when they try desperately, can't seem to lose weight. Because of that, we often assume it must be a lack of willpower. I begged my father, who was also a physician, to lose weight, and he never could. In the back of my mind, I, like many others, blamed him for his failures and considered it a lack of resolve. I blamed myself too. I became so disheartened at my inability to affect my weight that it harmed my mental health. I felt like a failure, which led to self-hatred and anger. A couple months ago, I went on a walk with a friend who had just lost a younger brother to heart disease. It was a reminder to me that time is limited and I should make use of it more wisely. I asked my doctor to write me a prescription for one of the new injectable obesity drugs. He warned me that it was approved at that time only for people with diabetes, and since I didn't suffer from that, this would be an off-label use and wouldn't be covered by insurance. These drugs are expensive, but I was determined to see what would happen if I took one. It is hard to explain what life is like on this medication to people who don't have trouble controlling their weight. I'm not hungry all the time. I'm not thinking about food incessantly. I'm not obsessing about what I wish I could eat and what I can't. My mental health and even my temperament improved so much that my whole family rejoiced. I've lost more than 20 pounds so far, and I've done it with pretty much ease. It can't just be because I'm eating much less, because I haven't reduced my caloric intake that much, but like everyone else, including scientists, I have no idea why these drugs work so well. Before writing about it, 
I had told just a few people I was on the drug. I think it was because, on some level, I still felt shame. I felt the same when I finally started taking an antidepressant. Mental health disorders and obesity fall into a bucket of diagnoses that, amid a lack of complete knowledge of their causes, are subject to societal moralizing and stigma. We make assumptions that people with depression aren't trying hard enough that people with obesity lack willpower. These stigmas are then compounded by a limited understanding of how their treatments work, leading to further judgments of people who seek them. This is especially true if there's no clear endpoint for treatment. I've heard so many thoughtful people argue against using these injectable drugs for weight loss because people often regain the weight if they stop taking them. Of course they do. Something is off balance with them that these drugs are correcting. We don't know what it is, but the drugs are compensating for it, not curing people permanently. As I've talked to you about before, I've had ulcerative colitis for almost 30 years. The medication I take to keep me in remission has a small but greater than zero chance of shutting down my bone marrow. Yet the upsides are hard to overemphasize. I will be on that drug for the rest of my life. I'm okay with that, and no one, including me, has ever questioned if it's a good idea to take it because I'll never be able to quit. We don't assume that people with type 1 diabetes who need to be on insulin, or people on thyroid medication, should have to stop someday. There are many other examples of conditions whose sufferers must undergo treatments for decades or more. The mechanisms for those diseases and disorders are usually better understood, though. They fix problems and use medications we've mapped out pretty clearly and are not perceived as being the result of a personal deficiency. It's when there's doubt and stigma that we question the need and the longevity. I'm sure these obesity drugs won't work for everyone. They won't overcome bad eating habits and many other issues. I'm also aware that we don't know their long-term effects. Most importantly, I know I'm privileged that I can afford to pay for them out of pocket. What we should focus on is their potential to improve lives significantly, much as they have for me. Medical treatment should not be dismissed just because we don't fully grasp their mechanisms. People who use them are not cheating. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this previous episode, which is an update on weight loss drugs. We'd really appreciate it if you'd like this video and subscribe to the channel down below. And maybe consider going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help support the show, make it bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Edward Lillaholm, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam. Hey.